Number one, we have the strategic apex. Can you please mute your microphone, please? Strategic okay. apex. Can you please mute your microphone? Felix and um, whoever. Okay, so you have the strategic apex. The strategic apex is simply the top um, management in the organization. That's what he refers to as a strategic apex. Then he, he, he also calls out the operating core, the operating core, the operating core. And under the operating core, this refers to, you know, the actual work of the organization and the individuals who, who do the actual work. So if it's a manufacturing organization, we are talking about the people who actually manufacture whatever product we are looking at here. You know, whatever product you are looking at here. So that's the manufacturing, the operating core, the operating core. That's the operating core. Very, very key. That's the operating core. Then you have the middle line. The middle line. So who are the middle liners? <laughs> who are the middle liners? These are the managers and the management structure between the strategic apex and the operating core. So the middle line is simply in between the apex and the operating core. The operating core are those who carry out the day-to-day -day work of the organization. The middle line is simply a layer between the strategic apex and the operating core. Then you have the support staff. The support staff, what do they do? The support staff provide support for the operating core. Provide support staff for the operating core. You know? they give support services. So like your cleaning, secretarial stuff, you know, all those things are support, support. They have techno structure. Techno structure. When we say techno structure, what do we mean? Techno structure. Techno structure. When we say techno structure, does anyone have an idea? Techno structure. Okay, let me just explain here. <clears throat> Sorry. So here we said these are staff without direct line management responsibilities, but who seek to standardize the way the organization works. They produce procedures and system manuals that others are expected to follow. Okay, this is quite a complicated definition. Um I'll say a tech that I'll say techno structure simply means a group of professionally skilled managers, such as people like scientists, engineers, you know, those kind of people. Uh -huh. Those are what we call techno structure. And these people um, tend to have, you know certain level of technical skills um, that are relevant to the running of, of the organization and that are relevant to the running of the organization. And that's what we mean by techno structure. It's basically a group of professionally skilled people, very, very skilled people who um, basically the organization needs to run. It could also be a group of um, people like technicians, technically skilled people um, who have like considerable influence in an organization. So when we say techno structure, when we say techno structure, always remember techno, it means technical, technically skilled, technically skilled, technically skilled, or a technical expert or a technologist, you know, somebody who has 
technical experience or technical expertise in a certain area that gives them considerable influence in the organization. Any questions on this model? Yes, sir. I have a question. Okay. Yeah, you are talking about the techno structure being uh, mainly for the technical or the technically skilled personnel. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. How is it different from the support staff where probably you can see the IT in the group has more technically inclined in terms of certain, um, in terms of um, information technology, they are more technically inclined as compared to you, uh, as compared to, sorry, and the uh, technically skilled employee um, staff? Yeah, that's a good question. So it depends on the organization, right? It depends on the organization. So first of all, we need to understand which organization are we looking at here, right? So if you are looking at, let's say Microsoft, right? If you are looking at Microsoft, which is into IT, right? There's no way IT will be a support staff. Because the core job of Microsoft is information technology or IT, you know? So there's no way, there's no way, um, there's no way, um, there's no way IT would be regarded as um, support staff. That's the main, that's the main job of the company. Uh -huh. So it depends on the company in question. If you pick, let's say banking, right? If you pick, oh, why is it not working? If you pick, let's say banking, right? What's the core job of banking, of, um, of the bank? The core job of the bank would be, um, basically deposits and withdrawals, you know, basically centered around money, managing money. Uh -huh. So you need to first of all, know the exact company you are looking at here, right? If you understand the, if you know the company you are looking at, then you'll be able to tell, you know, you'll be able to tell whether this is techno structure this will be part of techno structure or not. So from what you are, what you are asking me, you said IT staff, right? You might be thinking that IT staff is part of techno structure, right? That's what you're saying. Yes, yes, please. Uh -huh. IT staff is part of techno structure because you feel like um, IT have some special skill or special, um, or special, um, yeah, special skill or technical skills that make them part of techno structure, right? That's a very, very good question. But first of all, you need to know, okay, which organization? So give me an example of an organization and let's use that to decode the difference. Let's give me an example of any organization that you think um, we can use. Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm saying give me an example of an organization that we can use. I think you, you started with the Microsoft and the banks, which yeah. you uh, give the difference in the yeah. core. Um, yeah, so, 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 okay. Okay, so that example works for you, right? Okay, so yes, when we say somebody's a support staff, it means that they are non-core to the organization's operations. It means that they are non-core to the organization's operations. So what does that mean? You know, there are organizations where, you know, the accounting function is regarded as support staff because it's non-core. So in that case, they'll, they'll be regarded as support staff rather than technical structure. 
right? So for example, if you take a company like Tesla, right? What does Tesla do? Tesla is into building weird inventions like space travel, electric cars and all that, right? The accounting function is not core to their business. What is core to their business are engineers, designers, um, um, space architects. And so those people will be part of techno structure. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. so, so you always need to find out um, what organization are we looking at here? I hope, it, I hope it's clear. If it's not clear, let me know. Yes, sir, please, it's clear now. Okay, yeah. So always, always think about that first because sometimes if you go to PwC, right, or any of the big four companies, accountants, they are, they are not support staff because that's the core of the business. The core of the business is providing accounting audits, um, consulting services. So accountants are not um, support staff there. They are, you know, they are, they are the main people there. So they are techno structure. Right. So always keep that in mind. Okay, let's move on to the next thing. Means back six organizational configuration. This is an interesting model, right? Interesting. So, first off, Means back is saying there are six organizational con configuration, according to him. And he says that. First of all, there's what we call the simple structure. The simple structure. Yeah. So what's the simple structure? In the simple structure, you usually find, you usually find this structure in, in startups. In startups, the strategic apex exercises direct control over the operating core. So the top management will exercise direct control over the operating core and there's no middle line. I don't know if you've worked for an organization like that, but I have worked for an organization like that where it's a startup, it's an entrepreneurial company. So you will not see a middle line. You see the top management work directly to the employees to give them work. Uh -huh. And that's a startup or entrepreneurial company. There is no middle line. There's also little or no support staff or techno structure. The strategic apex might be an owner or director of the company, you see. Uh -huh. This type of structure is very flexible and can react quickly to changes in the environment. Because the strategic apex controls the operating core directly, directly. So that's very, very important. And that's a simple structure. And I'm sure my friend who was talking about working in the family business, you know, if it's here, you can share that with that. Do you think that in your, would you say your company has a simple structure? Do you yes, think that's the yes. case? I think, I think that's the case. Yeah, I thought so yeah. too, because, <laughs> okay. So the, the owners will come directly to you to give you work, right? The, yes, please. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that's yeah, that's how <laughs> um, startups or entrepreneurial companies are. There's no middle line, no support staff, no techno structure. It's very flexible and all that. Then you have machine bureaucracy. Machine bureaucracy. In the machine bureaucracy, the techno structure is the dominant element in the organization. And the entity is controlled and regulated by a bureaucracy and the emphasis on control through regulation. It is difficult for an entity with this type of organization to react quickly to environmental change. This structure is therefore more suitable for entities that operate in a stable environment. So yeah. This is the 
I'm sorry. This, this is the machine bureaucracy. Machine bureaucracy. Here, the techno structure is the more, more dominant element here. The most dominant element here. It's the most dominant element here. Is the most dominant element here. You know, then you have the professional bureaucracy. Here, the operating core is the most dominant element. The operating core is the most dominant element here. So that's why it's called professional bureaucracy. He has more professional people, professional people. Then you have the divisionalized form. In this type of structure, the middle line is the most dominant element. You know, and here there's a large group of powerful executive managers, you know, and the structure it has is a, it's more of a divisionalized structure where each, um, Division is led by a divisional manager. So it's a divisionalized form. So we think about it more in terms of the divisionalized structure that we talked about when we are talking about organizational structures. Then you have the ad hocracy. Ad hocracy. Always remember the word ad hoc. Ad hoc. So it's more of a complex and disorderly structure, which makes more use of teamwork and project-based work. It usually works in a very dynamic business environment when things are easily changing. So if a problem comes up, you just call people who have the skills to work on the problem, bring them together. And, and you know, make things happen. So it's ad hoc, ad hoc. You know, it's based on, you know, you know, based on the projects, basically. They have missionary organizations. In this type of organization, all the members share a common set of beliefs and values. And there is usually an unwillingness to accept change, you know. So that's a missionary organization, a missionary organization where people share a certain set of beliefs and values and People don't compromise or don't accept change. Hooray. So now let's talk about evaluating strategic performance. And I have set some important concepts straight. So let's talk about evaluating strategic performance. You know, this is one of the most interesting parts of strategy. And today we have a lot to do. So one of the models for evaluating strategic performance is what we call the balance scorecard. The balance scorecard. What's the balance scorecard? When we say the balance scorecard, um, think of it this way, balanced, right? A scorecard that is balanced. So a scorecard that covers both financial and non-financial objectives. You know, usually we we measure or evaluate the performance of an organization based on um, you know we measure we measure the success of an organization based on their financial performance. So with that we say that oh this organization has been able to achieve one million dollars in revenue. So they've done really well. But what about the non-financial objectives? Have you ever thought about that? You know, so what the balance scorecard is trying to bring here is to combine balanced and non-balanced, to combine financial and non-financial objectives. So the concept of the balance scorecard is that there are several key aspects of performance and that you should have targets for each of them. You know, it has a more longer term view of performance. You know? And so 
it's an interesting way of measuring performance. So let's look at the perspectives of performance that the balance card scorecard is proposing. Number one, you have the customer perspective, right? You see financial perspective below. Usually when accountants are measuring performance, all they think about is financial. As a person who is who should be a strategic business leader, you should look at all these four perspectives and see how the company is performing on them. Don't only look at financial. I know you are training to become an accountant, but be broad in your mindset, be holistic in your mindset. Look at financial and non-financial. So some of the non-financial factors, number one is customer perspective. You need to understand what customers value most. You know, you need to set targets on satisfying customers more effectively. You know, so things like how do you satisfy customers? You know, number one will be how you deliver things to them. The costs of your goods, value for money, the quality of your goods, all these things help to satisfy customers. Then you have internal perspective. Internal perspective. This looks like this looks at the processes of an organization, the processes, the operational performance of the organization. You know, so you want to understand you know, the operational processes of the organization and how well the organization is doing on that. So for example, a company may consider that customers value the quality of its services and that a key aspect of providing a quality service is the effectiveness of its operational controls in preventing errors from happening. You know, I gave you an example where there was a car company, I don't remember if it's Toyota, Audi, or one of these cars, they put out a car they started selling a car, then they realized that I think the gear or something like that, or the steering had a problem with it. That's an operational defect. You know, that's an operational defect. Yeah, that was, said, please. There was one like that. Yeah, which company was that? Which company was that? I think it was Toyota, their airbags. Yeah, their airbags, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a very good one, Toyota, yeah. So that's an operational problem, right? right? And it comes from slacking on the internal perspective, right? And if you have an operational problem, it's definitely going to affect your customer perspective. It's definitely going to affect that. So apart from the fact that these are four perspectives, they are intertwined. They are intertwined. They are all related. Then you have the innovation and learning perspective. And I'll show you how. You have the innovation and learning perspective. The focus here is trying to empower your employees, your workforce, through giving them the right tools, skills, and knowledge, you know, and making use of technology so that you know your employees will know, will be able to be knowledgeable. If they are knowledgeable, they'll be able to serve the customer better. If they are knowledgeable, they'll be operationally effective. If they are knowledgeable, um, your processes will be fantastic and it will help you achieve your financial perspective. Finan Under financial perspective, that's where we talk about profitability, revenue, growth, share price, growth, and all that. So you see all these four perspectives are intertwined. You know, if you are not satisfying your customers properly, your financial perspective will suffer. Right? If you are not innovating and learning as an organization, your customers might not get, you know, very, very good products. And so your financial perspective might suffer. If your operational performance is, if it's bad, you know, your financial perspective will suffer. So all these things feed into each other, feed into each other. So that's the balance scorecard. Very, very, it's one of my favorite models. Okay, so here I just talk about, it's the same thing, I just talk about the, the measures. So how do you measure customer perspective? You measure it by market share, market growth, customer profitability, customer retention, customer attraction, internal perspective. Typical example would be success rates in winning contract orders. Um, effectiveness of operational controls, production cycle, and all that. 
innovation and learning, um, you want to, some of the measures would be employee satisfaction, employee retention, turnover rates, you know, employee product and all that. So these are some of the measures. Um, I always send a slide so you can take a look at them. Okay, then let's move on to the performance pyramid. Still on evaluating strategic performance. Another performance evaluation model is the performance pyramid. The concept of a pyramid is based on the idea that an organization operates at different levels. You know, so pyramid, the performance can be therefore seen as a pyramid structure. The performance pyramid was developed by Lynch and Cross. They argue that traditional performance measurement systems were not as effective as they should be because they had a narrow financial focus. They argue that in a dynamic business environment, achieving strategic business objectives depends on good performance with regard to customer satisfaction, flexibility, productivity. Um, I just want you to see how the performance pyramid looks like. This is what it looks like, right? This is the presentation of the performance pyramid. So you have the corporate vision at the top. You have the corporate vision at the top, right? I hope I hope you I hope you can see it clear. You have the corporate yes, vision at the top. Then you have the business strategy at the second layer. You know, so here to be looking at your market strategy, your financial strategy. Then you have your business operating systems. The systems that you use to achieve your business strategy. You know. Then which comes down to your operations. It's just like how every organization is set up, basically. It's nothing new. It's nothing new. But it looks like these are the different levels that it has. These are the different levels that it has. So let's interpret the performance pyramid. Um, first off, you need to understand that objectives and targets are set from the top, which is the corporate vision down to the operational level. So if you look here, you know, objectives are set from the top. The objectives are set from the top, corporate vision down to the operational operations level. Performance is measured from an operational level upwards. That's how you measure performance. So when you're measuring performance, you measure performance from the bottom. Down, 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 up. That's how you set the targets. You set the targets down, 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 up. So if performance targets are achieved at the operational level, then targets should be achieved at the operating systems level. You know, I hope that's clear. A key level of performance measurement is at the operating system level. Oh. Why is this thing behaving this way? Oh. Okay. I think that's it. So I hope you see, I hope you see how it works, right? You see that, you see from here that, um, you see from here that you have you have um, objective set at the top and it comes down to the operational level, then performance targets or performance measures set from the bottom and goes up to the top. And goes up to the top. Another thing that we note, another thing that we note is that Um, 
you see, a key level of performance measurement, point two, is at the operating systems level. You know, a key level of performance is at the operating systems level. So if you go back to, um, if you go, this is operating systems level, which we already talked about. Three things define it, which is the customer satisfaction, flexibility, and productivity. So basically, um, that's what we are talking about here. We, we are saying that you have objectives that are set at the top, flows down to the bottom. Then you, we use that to set targets you know, for the organization. And once we achieve the targets operationally, you know, we'll be able to achieve the targets upwards. We'll be able to achieve the targets upwards. Okay, any questions so far? No, say I'm okay. Okay. Let's talk about the Fitzgerald and Moon building block model. Fitzgerald and Moon. Fitzgerald and Moon. So Fitzgerald and Moon provided a framework for analyzing performance management systems and service industries. They suggested that a performance management system in a service organization can be analyzed as a combination of three building blocks, dimensions, systems, and rewards. So Fitzgerald and Moon, you know, blessed us, blessed us with a good model, right? A model for analyzing performance in service industry. So if, for example, if you take a bank, you know, that doesn't provide physical goods. It's a service organization or a service industry. Um, it's in the service industry. How will you measure their performance? So it says you do that based on three building blocks. Number one, dimensions. Number two, standards. And number three, um, rewards. So let's start with dimensions. Dimensions of performance are the aspects of performance that are measured. You know, so here we need to understand what are the dimensions of performance that should be measured in order to assess performance, right? And Fitzgerald and Moon said there are six dimensions. There are six dimensions when it comes to service industries. Number one is profit. Number two is competitiveness. Number three is quality. Four, resource utilization. Five, flexibility. Six, innovation. Six, innovation. So, um, this is what you refer to as the dimension. So if you take the bank, a bank, for example, we would want to understand its profits, its profits, performance, its competitiveness, quality, how it delivers. If you go there to open an, um, an account, does it take 50 days? Or it takes, you know, you go there to get a loan. Is it like UT Bank, a loan in less than 48 hours? So it takes forever. Yeah. So those are the dimensions of performance. They have standards. They have standards. The second part of the Fitzgerald and Moon framework relates to setting ex expected standards of performance. Once you've dealt with the dimensions, now you need to set standards. You know, you need to set standards. And there are three aspects to setting st standards of performance. Number one is to what extent do individuals feel that they own the standards that will be used to assess their performance? So when you are setting standards for someone, right, make sure that they have the ability to own that standard, you know, to own that standard. Another thing is that are the standards fair? Are the standards fair? The standards are not fair you know, people most likely will not be able to, you know, work towards it or work to try and achieve it. Another question is that do the individuals held responsible, are the individuals held responsible for achieving the standards of performance, consider that these standards are achievable or not? So when you give a standards to someone, you need to discuss with the person, whether they think that this standard is actually achievable. You know, that's why your manager will ask you, do you think this is something you can do? You know, a good manager will try to ask you, do you think this is something that's achievable? You know. Um, so first off, number one, the standard must be fair, the standard must be achievable. 
and the standard must give you know the person who the standard is being given to the ability to own it to own it or to accept it they have rewards the third aspect of the Fitzgerald the moon performance management is rewards you know how rewards are given you know you should be able to link strategic objectives to operational performance and you should be able to understand how rewards help you to achieve operational performance and there are three uh, there are some things that you need to consider when you are looking at a good reward system you know a good reward system should motivate employees to work harder you know a good reward system you know should you know set reasonable targets you know you shouldn't go and give a reward where you know that this thing the person can achieve then you just provide a reward for it you know and the reward system should be clear to everyone so that if person a achieves their um a certain goal you know it's clear to him why he's being given a reward there should be no kululu around the rewards. There should be no kululu, basically. It should be clear to everyone. The reward system should not be complicated. It should be clear to everyone. It should be clear to everyone. Okay. Any questions on that? Before we move on into other matters, managing strategic change. Hmm. Any questions on that? Okay. If there are no questions, are there any questions? No, sir. Everything is okay. Okay. Let's move on to managing strategic change. This is another model as well, which is called the Lewin's force field analysis model. Not Lewin, no. not the Ghanaian actor Lewin. This is Lewin or Lewin. So Lewin, which is his name is Kurt Lewin, he was a social psychologist and he was able to understand how to manage strategic change. And he said that um, there are two opposing forces. Um, we have less than one minute. So when it goes off, please join again. Um, we have less than one minute. So when it goes off, please join. So he suggested that there are two opposing forces. They are the driving forces of change and they are the restraining forces of change. So the restraining forces that oppose and resist change, we have the restraining forces that oppose and resist change, and we have the driving forces that support the need for change or facilitate change. So change will not occur if the forces resisting the change are stronger than the driving forces for change. There's no way change will occur if the restraining forces are stronger change is only possible when the driving forces for change are much more stronger so this is a simple diagram that shows that restraining forces driving forces um and those